Okay, today we're going to talk about intangible assets. This will be a relatively brief lecture. Intangible assets are non-current or long-term assets. We typically have three categories of long-term assets. Long-term investments like stocks and bonds and maybe land we purchase for speculative purposes. We got property, plant, and equipment, which we've talked about. And we have intangible assets. If we look at the slide, we're just really going to look at four intangibles. There are other intangible assets. And the reason we call them intangible is that they don't really have any physical substance. Property, plant, and equipment, furniture, I knock on it, it makes a sound, it's got physical substance. All these items are, are either intellectual property or legal protection or the rights, contractual rights. Okay, so there's no physical substance. They're documented on paper, but the paper doesn't give them substance. So we call them intangible assets. And let's just take a look at these four intangible assets. A patent is when you invent a new product or process of doing something that's unique. No one else has done it before. And so the government wants to reward creativity and ingenuity. And so you file for a patent, which is a legal right to protect you from other people copying your idea, your product. Okay, and it's an expensive process to apply and it takes a while. They have to do a search to make sure no one else has invented your product or idea before you. And then if no one has, they grant you patent protection. Now there's no guarantee that some big company won't bully you around, copy your product, and then you try to sue them, but you can't afford the legal process. That unfortunately happens, but that aside, um, you now have 20 years of protection so that you can develop your product, sell it on the open marketplace, and then at the end of 20 years, it, the doors to competition open up. You lose your patent protection, and then other companies can legally copy your product. Now, competition uh, has a few very beneficial side effects. Competition causes prices to go down because we're all competing for business, and so the price of the product gets cheaper for customers, and typically, the products will get better. They'll get smaller, lighter, more features, more options, more powerful. Look at cell phones. Look at all the things they can do now. Okay? It's because competition for your business has encouraged all these companies to offer you the best possible product out there. So you get 20 years legal protection when your patent gets granted, and then it expires, and then competition sets in. A copyright is when there's artistic work involved. You wrote a book, music, a movie, photography, a play, and so copywriting prevents, or hopefully prevents, people from copying your work. So someone writes a book, I can't come around and, and change the name ever so slightly and try to ride on the coattails of the success of that book. All right, so copyright, when granted, gives the author or the creator legal protection for the, their entire life plus an additional 70 years. Now how these numbers came about, I don't honestly know. Okay, but the legal life of a copyright is the life of the author plus an additional 70 years, seven zero. Okay, a trademark. Now I'm not an artist, as I will demonstrate momentarily, but trademarks are logos or trade names that are very recognizable, okay? Most of us would recognize that as Nike. Most of us would recognize this symbol as Pepsi. Here's Mercedes-Benz. Okay, this is the peace sign. Don't get them confused. Okay, so that's the Mercedes-Benz. This is a uh, pathetic rendition of BMW. And that about exhausts my artisti artistic talent. But you get the idea, these are very recognizable symbols. These are trademarks, and companies spend an awful lot of money promoting these logos so that you and I make some sort of connection with the product, whether it's flavor, taste, satisfaction, prestige, whatever it may be, they work good and hard to attract our attention and hopefully our dollars to buy their products. Now, a trademark can be renewed every 10 years for a relatively small fee. So we say that trademarks have an indefinite or infinite life. 
as long as you renew them, they'll just keep going and going. And then there's goodwill. Now, I'm going to come back to goodwill. Goodwill has a very unique definition in accounting that's a little bit different than what you and I think of as goodwill. Over the holiday season, goodwill, you know, happy holidays, all that stuff, that's one form of goodwill. This is a different definition, okay? And then there's something called research and development, which we call R&D. Now, this is not an intangible asset, but it obviously relates to intangible assets. So we have to discuss it along with intangible assets. But notice, it's not an asset, it's an expense we incur. And I'll come back to R&D in just a little bit. Okay, so we talked about the characteristics of intangible assets. No physical substance, typically intellectual property of some sort. It is non-current or long-term. And notice, it either has a limited life, like a patent, 20 years, or a copyright, author's life plus 70, or it has an indefinite or infinite life, like trademarks and goodwill. If it has a limited life, a defined life, then we amortize the intangible asset. Now, that's a fancy word. It simply means depreciate, just like we depreciate property, plant, and equipment. And that means spread the cost out over the useful life of the asset. Okay? So amortize means depreciate. If that, you know, if that makes you more comfortable, Think of it as depreciation, but amortization is the term we use for intangible assets. We also amortize loans, like mortgages and bonds, etc. If it has an indefinite life, you can't spread out a cost indefinitely, so we do not amortize those intangible assets that have an indefinite life. Okay? We'll come back to that. In fact, we're getting there, I think, right now. Okay, so amortization is the same as depreciation expense. We're going to debit amortization expense and we'll credit either the actual asset account, credit the patent account, or copyrights, or if we want, we can use the accumulated amortization account. Okay? Just like we have accumulated depreciation, for intangible assets we can have accumulated amortization. But it is more common simply to credit the account patents or copyrights. Okay? So, again, amortization expense, we're spreading out the costs of the asset over its useful life in accordance with the matching concept. And this brings us to an important point here. Okay? Now, and I don't think I put it on my slide here, so let me mention it. We have to compare the legal life of a patent or a copyright to what we call the useful life. Remember how we estimated a useful life for a piece of equipment? Five, six, seven, ten years. Maybe the useful life for a building, thirty years. We have to do the same thing for an intangible asset, okay? And most of the time, the useful life will be shorter than the legal life, okay? So when we say, well, how many years should I amortize this asset over? It's the shorter period between legal life and useful life, and it's almost always the useful life. So try to remember that, okay? And there's our journal entry, debit amortization expense. That goes on the income statement. This is an adjusting entry here, okay? That'll show up as an expense on the income statement. It does get closed out at the end of the period. And then we either credit the patent account or accumulated amortization. Okay? Notice, goodwill and trademarks have indefinite lives, so we don't amortize them. Okay, so let's talk about goodwill. When one company purchases another company, if the purchase price a company buys B company, or in our example here, A buys Z. If the purchase price that we pay for that company is greater than that a company that we're acquiring, their company's what we call fair market value, then the difference between purchase price and fair market value is, goes to an account we call goodwill, an intangible asset. We must have seen some long-term benefit that would cause us to pay basically a premium, a greater amount than the fair market value. So we think over the long run, over many years, we're really going to benefit from buying this company and that even though we're paying more than the fair value, today's fair value, in the long run, it really makes good business sense. Now, hopefully we're right. Not all companies uh, have been correct in this assumption. Let's take a look at our example. Company A buys company Z for $5 million. Company Z has a fair market value of $4 million, 
So we paid $1 million more than the fair value of the company. We would debit an intangible asset called goodwill for $1 million. Okay? The only time you ever record goodwill is when you purchase another company. Okay? You can't just arbitrarily assign a dollar value to all the goodwill you believe you're creating with your existing company. It's, it's just far too subjective, and GAAP, US GAAP, does not allow this. Okay? So we only record goodwill when we buy another company. And the same thing for patents. Let me backtrack just a little bit. A little bit. We may spend a lot of money with research and development to develop a patent, a new product. But the law says, and GAP says, we can only capitalize, and when I say capitalize, that's the dollar amount that we're going to put in the patent account. So here's my patent account. Remember, this is an asset, and as a result, the amount that I debit, the value, the cost of the patent, only includes what we call legal and recording costs. No R&D. This is actually a contentious area in accounting. A lot of people have problems with how we account for R&D, but that's a separate discussion. So this number, the amount that we debit to copyrights or patents, if we develop them internally, in-house, within our company is any legal costs we incur and filing and recording costs with the government once they grant us the patent or the copyright. All that R&D we spent developing that product, we have to expense R&D in the year that we incur those costs. Okay? Very specific rules. Okay? So, we do not amortize goodwill because it has an, in, it has an indefinite life. Okay? We simply We'll record goodwill when we record the acquisition of the company. And don't worry about the journal entry that, for that. It's, it's more the concept we're concerned about. Okay, and this goes in the intangible assets section. Okay, as mentioned, we do not capitalize any research and development costs. They get expensed. They go right to the income statement. No matter how much we spend on R&D, even if it results in a successful product being launched and a patent being granted, we do not capitalize them. They keep it off the balance sheet. This may change in the future. Who knows? Right now, we simply expense research and development. Now, I do want to mention one more thing related to patents. And this is kind of unique to patents. In the event somebody copies our product and we sue them for what's called copyright infringement, if we successfully defend our patent, in the court of law, then whatever cost we incurred to pay our attorneys to defend our patent, that amount we would debit the patent account. We would not debit legal expense. We would debit the patent account, and then that amount would get amortized over whatever remaining life we were amortizing the patent over. In the event another company copies our patent, we sue them and we lose that lawsuit, then we were unable to defend our patent those legal costs would be debited to legal expense, go on the income statement, and we would have to write off the entire patent as worthless. We were unable to defend our patent. Someone else out, is, out there is copying our product, and there's nothing we can do about it. That would be, a, that would be unfortunate. Okay? Now, hopefully, if we sue someone else and we win that lawsuit, hopefully they would pick up our legal costs. But in the event we have to pay for those legal costs, in a successful defense, we capitalize those legal costs, and then we amortize the cost over the useful life of the patent. It's considered to be part of the cost of the patent itself. Okay, in addition to property, plant, and equipment, which gets depreciated, and intangible assets, which get amortized, some companies own natural resources. Could be natural gas reserves in the Gulf of Mexico. It could be thousands of acres of timber up in Montana, Canada, wherever. Could be a copper mine, could be a coal mine. Lots and lots of different types of natural resources. And the term we use related to natural resources is depletion. We deplete natural resources. It's something that's being extracted from the planet Earth, okay? Or some other planet for that matter. Well, we'll stick with planet Earth for now. 
So we use depletion expense when we extract copper, coal, natural gas, we cut down trees for timber, etc. Notice, given that we typically, if I own a coal mine or a copper mine, you typically sell everything that you extract. These are what's called commodities, where you can pretty much sell everything you extract from the earth. We may, instead of debiting depletion expense, we may simply debit cost of goods sold. Okay? I'm going to walk you through a brief example of natural resources. And this is not an area that um, I'm going to be heavily tested. This is a kind of a, an area that's unique to certain businesses, but it's worth discussing. Okay? So natural resources get depleted. Here's an example. If we paid $50 million for a copper mine, and maybe we bought the rights either from another company or from the U.S. government, the uh, Bureau of Land Management, and there's 10,000 tons, and this is clearly an estimate. It's impossible to know exactly how much coal, copper, whatever it is you're extracting is down there. So we estimate, and these are our engineers, our so-called experts who help us to figure this out. We estimate there's 10,000 tons of copper reserves in this mine. And we paid $50 million, so we'll debit copper deposits, copper mine, whatever we want to call it. Okay, it's a natural resource long-term or non-current assets, separate category from property, plant, and equipment, separate category from intangible assets. Clearly, it's tangible, but we, it's a separate category called natural resources. And we credit cash, maybe we credit notes payable, whatever, however we finance this, this particular deal. All right, now our depletion expense would be, well, we paid $50 million, and we expect to extract 10,000 tons of copper, so that's going to cost us about $5,000 of depletion expense for each ton that we extract, given relatively current market prices. Now let me make a quick comment. In the event that once we've completely depleted this copper mine, we've got a great big hole in the earth, if there's any salvage value to this land that we can then sell this property, we would do the same thing as we did for equipment. We take the cost, $50 million, minus any salvage value, and then we divide it by the total number of units we expect, expect to extract from the earth. Okay, in this example, we'll assume no salvage value. Okay, so once we have our cost of depletion per ton of copper, or whatever the resource may be, then let's assume in the current year we extracted 2,000 tons. Okay, so 2,000 tons times $5,000 per ton Okay, the cost of that copper is $10 million. If we can sell a ton of copper for $7,000 per ton, then our journal entries would be, upon the sale of the copper, debit cash or accounts receivable, $14 million credit sales revenue, $14 million. And we would have to record the cost of the sale, cost of goods sold, debit cost of goods sold at our cost, which is $10 million, right? $5,000 per ton, we sold 2,000 tons. And notice, we might debit depletion expense, but more commonly you can debit cost of goods sold in this, in this uh, instance. And we would credit the copper deposits or copper mine, whatever the name of the asset is that we recorded up there. Okay, so a quick example of depletion. Uh, this is not an area that I would heavily test you on. I'm more focused on the property, plant, and equipment and intangible assets part. Okay, but I did want to make mention of this. Here's an example of a balance sheet at the end of a particular year. Here's property, plant, and equipment, land, buildings, equipment. You could have other categories. There's the original cost. There's the accumulated depreciation we've taken as of December 31st, 2001. Notice we don't depreciate land, but everything else does get depreciated. And book value, which is the amount we put on the balance sheet, is cost minus accumulated depreciation. Okay, and there's the book value, total property, plant, and equipment at book value, 679000 Okay, here's my natural resources. I have mineral deposits, some, 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 something up in Alaska, I have something in Wyoming. Cost, the amount of accumulated depletion, okay, gives us our book value. So that's the amount we've extracted so far. That should be depletion. And then we have intangible assets. We have a patent. 
We have goodwill. The patent gets amortized over the shorter period between legal and useful life. Goodwill does not get uh, amortized. Total intangible assets, 125000 This is in the non-current assets section of my balance sheet. This is how we would present it in the financial statement. Okay, last comment. If an intangible asset, we're back to intangible assets now, if we don't amortize or write off the cost of this asset because it has an indefinite life, then what we do need to do is we need to ask ourselves at least once per year, has there been any loss in the value of this asset? Okay, and we call that we, a test for impairment to the value of the asset. And we conduct what we call an impairment test. We don't need to know the specifics from an accounting standpoint, but just the concept that we test at least annually to see if the value's gone down. We do something similar with inventory. You may remember lower of cost or market test. Uh, accounts receivable, we estimate the allowance for bad debt. We do the same thing here. This is the concept of conservatism in accounting. If there's bad news, if there's a loss in value, let the people looking at your financial statements know about it as soon as you know about it. Report it in the year that you discover this. So we test annually for impairment of value. If there is an impairment, I would record an impairment loss, debit impairment loss or impairment expense. That hits the income statement. And I would credit the asset to reduce its value to its new lower market value based on that impairment. Okay, that's it for intangible assets.